And welcome back to Real People with Stan Simpson. Reverend Jeff Grant is co-founder of the Progressive Prison Ministries in Greenwich, a former New York City lawyer. He lost his license more than a decade ago when he was convicted of scamming the federal government for a fraudulent loan. He's focused now on his faith and counseling other white-collar offenders like himself make the complicated transition from prison. So we talked about the sordid stuff, although you were saying, you know what, it's part of your testimony. I know you probably, I said, you probably hate telling that story over and over again. You say, no, you know what, you're comfortable with it because it's part of your testimony and part of your platform. Yeah, there's, there's power yeah. in, in telling our stories. Right. And so I'm, I'm grateful to be able to do that. So the transition, seminary school, you make the transition, man of the cloth, man of faith, wanting to serve, right? So then talk to us about that, making that sort of Coming from, and, and by, by the way, in prison, what was the most horrifying thing you saw in prison? Well, I, I saw two murders in prison. So two murders. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, it's, it's fast and it's violent and nothing like I've ever seen in my life or expected to see and certainly. So how that shape, how does that shape your psyche when you see that? Because prison we know can be a rough place. Well, certainly it's given me more empathy and understanding for how people act in difficult circumstances right and obviously the world's in a lot of difficult circumstances right, right now and and so I, I try to lead with with that kind of compassion and kindness and but it, you know it's informed by all these experiences I had and so. we say the murder not getting into the graphic details but one was a stabbing I think I think I was reading somewhere in a magazine was, some guy a, stabbed someone with a with a knife in one, his neck right mm -hmm. what was the other uh, the situation? other one was uh, a guy who had been he was grabbed by his dreads Right, they're playing it, basketball, right? And, and then it's gotten to a fight. down to the floor and... Just crushed the skull in, right? Yeah. So, that's, mm -hmm. so that shapes your being, too. When you're there, I'm sure that sh as you're healing and rehabilitating, uh, you're seeing a different part of life that a kid from a Marinick that used to Well, I grew see. up on Long Island. So Long Island, but, but, you know, that's but still, not, I never saw anything, anything like, like that. that right? yeah, so, sure. that, so how do you think that, that shaped, as you go into the ministry, obviously there's empathy there, but... That must still remain with you. Not everyone has seen people get killed. Well, when I came out of seminary, uh, my, my first job was a, in an uh, um, inner city church in Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, there's a lot of learning about, about um, what was going on in, uh, in uh, it was an all black church mm -hmm. in, uh, in an impoverty, impoverished area. And How were you received? Beautifully, actually. Beautifully. Uh, one of the reasons is that, is that um, I put my privilege on the table. I never lied about who I am or pretended to be. The fact that I was incarcerated, had been incarcerated, didn't mean I understood anything about right. how uh, any of the people in that, in that parish had, um, had grown up. And so by being genuine and authentic and vulnerable, right. we communicated on that level. And then I was at a um, nonprofit. In, well, I won't build on it because a lot of times you have white guys who are uncomfortable in black audiences for whatever reasons, they have a stigma, whatever. And what I've tried to tell folks is that if you are genuine, right, black audiences, black people will be your, because as long as you're authentic, black folks will never be racist if you're yourself. I and, agree. And you show no racism. People sometimes get intimidated, get afraid, they don't be themselves. But if you're yourself, that's your best calling card of dealing with I agree black 100%. Audiences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But go ahead. I digress. <laughs> no, no. And, then, uh, I, and then I was um, at Family Reentry in Bridgeport for yeah. 10 years, seven on the board of directors, and um, a little over two years as their executive director. And so that uh, large criminal justice nonprofit here in Connecticut with offices and programs in eight cities. And so running that was a that was a blessing. Right, but your focus is on white collar criminals, Completely. right? Well, I right now we have a national ministry, right, headquartered here in Connecticut, but a national ministry, where we um, serve people who are prosecuted for white collar crimes and their families. Right, and uh, there are a lot of services involved, but most notably. We're known for a online support group that we've been running for, for white collar criminals. For white collar criminals. What kind of what kind of offenses? When we say white collar, we can assume they're they're nonviolent. We're really saying what kind of what kind of. Well, you know, it's, they've called you the hedge fund minister. I read somewhere, the right? Minister to hedge funders. Minister, fund hedge fund minister to hedge funders. Yeah, that's my that's my phone call. Um, these are mostly occupational crimes. Yeah. Um, but not always. I mean, for example, pen and paper crimes, right? Doing a lot of things. Yeah, well, with not it. always. I mean, yeah. you can have a guy, for example, who's um, had his third DUI and he's going to go to prison gotcha. and a felony and he's never going to be able to go back to the job he had. So there's a, it's a pretty fluid term right. and we accept almost everybody in regardless. But um, uh, we're best known, I would say, for our, our support group, our online support right. group. So we're way ahead of the curve in, do, in terms of doing online support groups. So on 
this April 13th, so in four weeks coming up, um, at 7 o'clock local time here in, uh, here in Connecticut, we'll be holding our 200th support group meeting online. Mm -hmm. And that's huge because most criminal justice organizations, grassroots ones, they, they never get off the ground. They never get to their third meeting. What's the biggest frustration, the thing you hear most from white collar criminals? What is their biggest frustration in getting back into society? Well, I would say it's two things. The first is that there's no compassion. There's a lot of stigma and shame. Right. And people do not have the right view of what it is to be involved in these crimes. I've, I've heard you say that you believe there's more stigma and shame for a white collar criminal than for someone who's not a white, for someone who's a street criminal. You believe the shame and stigma is worse for a guy like you than someone from the hood who maybe didn't have the education you had and didn't, but wasn't a lawyer. Explain why. Well, mostly because what happens with people who've been uh, prosecuted for white collar crimes that we're a mirror that we're holding up to white society, an affluent white society, and they would rather just shove us away and not have to look too closely at themselves. But that reality. The reality of themselves. Oh, okay. Because every, you know, a lot of people ride the line, yep. and I went over the line. You got caught. <laughs> I, I, no, no, but I went over the right. line. There's no question. I'm taking, you know, I did, but we encourage everybody to first take responsibility for your behavior, right. and then make amends and try to do the right things, and then uh, within here, within it somewhere, we're practicing acceptance. Stop like living in the past and stop projecting the future and live in the moment and by that we can minister and help them actually get um, their way to productive happy fulfilling lives so you're a bit of a threat the image of you in a place like Greenwich or Westport the image of you and what happened is a bit of a threat because they say oh my god they were for the grace of God God go I that could be me this guy who was well trained well uh, grew up in all the right places they see possibly themselves in you, you're saying that kind of situation. Absolutely. And so therefore, they don't want to deal with you. They want to shun you because you may bring in memories that they don't want to. That's interesting. And absolutely. Although, although it's gotten better. Right. When I when I started doing this work, about 12 or 13 years ago, um, you couldn't even discuss criminal justice in polite company. Right. I mean, it was just a. It, it was not a. a it was not dinner table conversation. It's changing now, though, right? It's but like it's changed be, and, and because there's a lot of um, white collar, blue collar. It's starting yeah, to really the, change. Yeah, criminal justice is uh, is on everybody's yeah. um, topic um, every day, and people are talking about it with their children. We're, we're going to talk about why there's more empathy because there has been a sea change, particularly here in Connecticut, where the mentality seems to have changed. Where folks now understand that most of those folks in prison are coming back out. And why shouldn't they have a second chance for housing and jobs? So I want to, we're a little bit out of time. I want to come back and continue our conversation with Jeff Grant. He is co-founder of the Progressive Prison Ministries in Greenwich, a former New York City lawyer. He lost his license more than 10 years ago after he was convicted of scamming the federal government for a fraudulent loan. He is now focused on his faith and counseling other white collar offenders make the complicated transition from prison. Don't go away. You're watching Real People with Stan Simpson. Thank you.